your the title is Jesus Ministry, and <laughs> Brother Aaron said he and I have been talking about trying to look at uh, an, a clearer understanding of the order and organization of the gospel records. What do they call it? The harmony of the gospels. It's, it's uh, an art form, not a science. And I think you would agree with that, Aaron. You've been looking at this longer than I have. <laughs> but there are areas within understanding the gospel record where there are periods of almost like six months where there's nothing right in the middle of the gospel record of, of no record of what happened over this period of time. And so uh, why I'm telling you this, brethren, is because I'm going to be putting some graphics up on the screen, and I know they're not going to come through very well because there's so much text and this happened, this happened, this happened. But we're going to highlight just a few events primarily at the outset of Jesus' ministry towards the um, middle of his ministry. That's kind of uh, the focus of our uh, uh, effort uh, this afternoon in looking at Jesus' ministry. And I think, uh, just as Aaron spoke, I, I have found myself sort of trying to figure out the order and organization of the harmony of the Gospels, very illuminating. And, and I'll throw something out for you, brethren, <clears throat> that we will get to in the by and by in this lesson. <clears throat> you look at the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew is so unchronological that you might look at chapter 5 to chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount, and think that probably happened fairly early in Jesus' ministry. Happened roughly in the middle of his ministry. And, and we'll get to this. We'll expand on this a little later. Uh, there's a certain symmetry to Matthew's writing. Uh, perhaps some suggest, and I think with some validity, that Matt, the Gospel of Matthew uh, working with Jewish sensibilities centers around five discourses and frames the entire uh, story around those five discourses. <clears throat> and it, it's very easy to tell as you go through the harmony of the Gospels in Matthew 5, chapter 5 through chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Well, Matthew doesn't become a disciple until the ninth chapter in the book of Matthew. However, if you compare Luke's record and Luke the sixth chapter, it's very interesting. Uh, Luke the sixth chapter talks about Jesus going up on a mountain and praying uh, for, uh, for, for the Lord's guidance and direction and choosing his apostles. And then he gathers his apostles and he chooses the 12 out from the many that have appeared before him. And then immediately following after that, in the, Luke's record, although we think it was perhaps just a little, if you read Luke's record in the sixth chapter, you'd almost think he prayed during that night and then in the morning gathered the, uh, all the disciples, chose the apostles and then give the Sermon on the Mount. And I don't think it actually happened that way. It's a thumbnail presentation that perhaps shortly thereafter, this choosing of the 12, that the Sermon on the Mount was given. And it's, it's interesting, uh, brethren, because it, it informs us, I think, on how to read the Sermon on the Mount, to whom it was said, as Aaron said, to whom was he speaking, what was he saying, uh, message to uh, the larger group, but a message specifically to his disciples and specifically to the uh, recently chosen apostles. Okay, now here's where it gets dicey. The notes are the bane of my existence. I, I'm probably better off if I don't use notes, but let me just cull a few items for you, brethren. Brother Aaron, spoke of, and I'm going to start going through some of these slides and you'll readily 
understand what I'm saying when I say it's a little hard to, uh, this works perfectly well on a, on a Zoom presentation where you can stop and see. And uh, I know that text is so small, you won't be able to pick up on it uh, very easily, but I, I did want to give you kind of this quick overview, which I don't expect you to all absorb. And, and if anyone's interested, I'd be happy to give you the link to this specific uh, website that has this chronological order. And I, as I said, it's more of an art than a science in this sense. One of my favorite books uh, concerning Jesus is uh, Dean Frederick Farrar's The Life of Christ. Have any of the brethren here read that? Yeah. Oh, I love that book. It's 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 ye olde writing, just like back in the pastor's day. <laughs> but I, I, his turn of phrase and his incisive thinking, I, I, it's it's my go-to every memorial to get my mind in memorial season. I read the chapters regarding uh, our Lord's sacrifice, and that man. Um, was a jewel of the Lord, uh, Dean Frederick Farrar. Uh, and I don't remember who told me this, but someone told me that the pastor had so much regard for his writing, for his work, that he sent him a first volume. So evidently, I don't know much of the name of it, but uh, nonetheless, brethren. So we're going to kind of pick up on something that uh, Aaron was touching on. So if you've got your Bibles handy, turn to uh, John, the first chapter, and we're going to do a bit of a walkthrough on that. And we will pick up here at the bottom here. The scene is set. John the Baptist has begun his ministry. Perhaps he was six months older than Jesus perhaps around the spring of 29. And then we find ourselves, if you look at this uh, map, and I don't know how well it's coming through, how well you're able to see it. Uh, John is baptizing. Many are coming to him. And who are coming to him? Israelites, indeed, the remnant, those who want to be cleansed and come back into harmony with God through the law covenant. That was John's uh, purpose of John's baptism. Now, we're told that Jesus was baptized, and what happened immediately after Jesus was baptized? What happened? Oh, okay, yeah. Thank you. I, I was actually, you're right. You, you, you bested me on that. I, what I was thinking of immediately following his baptism, he went into the wilderness. And in fact, Mark literally says that immediately after his immersion, he went into the wilderness. So you have to know that. And Aaron nailed this when he was saying, if you turn to um the scripture in uh, scriptures in uh, John the first chapter, <clears throat> when you are reading, <clears throat> excuse me, when you are reading the account where John is saying the how he had baptized Jesus, and um, he was in interestingly enough, brethren, it says uh, the Jews sent. Uh, Pharisees to him and explain who you are. Well, I'm not the Messiah, he says, etc. Uh, he who is coming after me is, verse 27, is preferred before me, whose shoes latched I am not worthy to unloose. And he said, these things were done. Your King James has an interesting name, but in the uh, Greek, it actually means Bethany beyond Jordan. So there was a Bethany south of Jerusalem. This is another little enclave or village east of the Jordan where John had been baptizing at. We know of two places, possibly three, in the Jordan where John had been baptizing. But here it was in Bethany. And if I can highlight this, brethren, how, how many here have been to the Holy Land, have been to Israel, and have been to the immersion site? 
where John was baptizing at, there is a whole area there. That's a pretty credible place in actual fact. So uh, Bethany uh, on this, let's see if I can hit my red cursor moving around here. This map shows Bethany up here. That's a, an approximation, I guess. We think it was actually further south than this, brethren. And it's partly, and it's somewhat important to try and get the geography. When I was a kid, um, my parents bought my sister and I a set of encyclopedias full of pictures. And all I remember, I loved history as a kid. And I especially loved explorers. I gave up comics for those encyclopedias because <laughs> I just lay on the floor and I would read about Magellan and read about all the explorers and people of history. I was fascinated by it. Uh, and the illustrations helped me a lot. And I've always enjoyed a geographical component connected to history because it just makes it easier uh, to identify. This picture in this lower section here, brethren, that I'm zapping, that is this area where uh, that's called the Wilderness of Judea, just to the west of the um, Salt Sea, it's calling it here, the Dead Sea, uh, where it's believed that Jesus went for those 40 days. So John's account in the first chapter of John <clears throat> is he is the account of him baptizing Jesus. Uh, verse 32, John bear record saying, I saw the spirit des uh, descending from heaven like a dove and the boat on him. That is not concurrent with the event. As Aaron said, he's talking about what had happened 40 plus days earlier. And Jesus now has come back and he is in this area, Bethany across from the Jordan, and John sees him, and John says, he is whom that came before me, but at the time, I didn't know. I, I wasn't sure he was the Messiah, and he sees them. There's a whole series of uh, verse 29, verse 35, and others that say, the next day this happened, the next day that happened. The next day in verse 29, John says, after the next day, speaking to these Pharisees, he saw Jesus and he said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Because of what had happened during the immersion, he knew, as, as the voice of God spoke, that this is my son in whom I am well pleased. But he goes on and says, the very next day, John stood with two of his disciples. One is named, one is not. <clears throat> one of them, the one that is named, was Andrew. And the other disciple universally is believed to be John. And they hear the words of John the Baptist, and they, the two disciples heard John speaking, verse 37, and they followed Jesus. And then Jesus turned and, verse 38, saw them follow him. They said, Rabbi, what do you seek? And they said, Rabbi, where are you dwelling? We want to spend some time with you. <coughs> oh, excuse me, brother. And they spent the day with them, and it was about the 10th hour, Jewish reckoning, that's four o'clock in the afternoon. And the two are convinced that they have found the Messiah after spending a few hours with him. And such that Andrew, <coughs> excuse me, I have a tickle in my throat. Uh, Andrew goes and finds his brother. Who was Andrew's brother? Simon Peter. And he says, Simon, Simon, we have found the Messiah. We have found the Christ. Can you imagine? They had just spent a short little time with Jesus. They hadn't seen a miracle. They hadn't seen anything overwhelming evidence uh, signs from on high. They had spoken to him and heard his words and rushed to Peter and said, we have found the Messiah. And they brought him to Jesus. 
And when Jesus beheld Simon, the son of Jonah, uh, what did he say to him? He said, you are Cephas. Isn't that interesting? You, and that's the Aramaic word for you are the rock. You are the stone. Right. Very first meeting. It, so later we hear, and I think, Aaron, you mentioned this, how he had uh, asked the disciples, well, who do the people say that I am? And who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up and says, thou art the Christ. And he said, your name is what? Peter, Petros, the rock. Because on this foundation, I will build my church. The foundation of Jesus as Messiah. Well, from the very moment that he laid eyes on Simon, he said, you are the rock. Uh, isn't that amazing? Right from the get-go. Do you think that kind of shook Simon just a little bit? Like, uh, okay, what's all this about? What, what does this mean? So, <clears throat> and the day following, uh, the very next day from this, he finds Philip. And Philip was from Bethsaida, just right next door to um, uh, Capernaum on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. and and Philip then finds Nathaniel and says to him, we found him. We have found the Messiah who the prophets have spoken of. And there is the whole story of Nathaniel. <laughs> Excuse me. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And, and um, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him. And said, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom was no guile. And he said, Nathaniel, before Philip even spoke to you, I saw you under the fig tree. And I wonder what happened. I wonder what Nathaniel, also known as Bartholomew in scripture, I wonder what his prayer was. Because Nathaniel is so astonished. I saw you under the fig tree. And then he turns and said, you are the Messiah. And uh, Nathaniel answered and said, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. And Jesus takes a step back. And he says, because I said that I saw you under the fig tree, you believe? I'm telling you, you will see greater things than this. You will see the uh, heavens open and angels, the angels of God descend, uh, ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And stop and think of what that is, brethren. He said to Nathaniel, as a faithful Jew who knows your history and your relationship with God, you know the story of Jacob and his dream and his vision. Where is that? In, uh, I know I've got it in my notes. I don't want to look. I'll get all confused. I think it's in Genesis 28, I think. Um, in any event, um, Jesus is saying here, in asks, brethren, I think, in fact, I, Jesus, am the ladder, and the angels will descend upon me from earth to heaven and from heaven to earth. Jesus is the conduit between man and God. And I've, I've been reading this, and I'm wondering, because the Jews perceived the picture of the aimed the vision that uh, Jacob was given as the information from heaven being disseminated to man. I'm wondering if he was thinking about that in his prayer, seeking guidance and divine guidance from God, just like angels ascending and descending on this ladder. And Jesus makes reference to that. I wonder if that's part of what uh, Nathaniel's prayer under the fig tree was all about. Now, 
I want you to stop and think about this for a moment, brethren. Brother Russell says, and, and, and I like this a lot, that Jesus was probably immersed around AD 29 on October the 3rd. This is a suggestion in a reprint article. You know, if Jesus was born on the atonement day, which I kind of like, uh, his birthday would have actually been that year, uh, would have been October the 6th. So my point on this is, if he was immersed in the first week of October, 40 plus days after that, would have been sometime mid-November where these incidents take place with uh, Andrew, uh, we believe John being the disciple who isn't named, and then with Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel. Now, isn't it interesting? Jesus is with the area that John is immersing at. These are all in the words of Jesus to Nathaniel. They're all Israelites indeed. They are the faithful remnant who are trying to come back into harmony with God. My point on the understanding what, where, when, how, etc., is that this incident took place, a series of incidents took place around the middle of November. And um, four, well, three of these named, because James is not named here, the brother of John, um, they are fishermen, fishermen from Bethsaida and fishermen from Capernaum. And interestingly enough, the fishermen in that area <clears throat> make their money in the winter time. So they had put their religious interests, devotion to God over making money because they had left their nets, their boats, etc., in this fertile time of fishing. And when I was reading some background material on this, uh, uh, the brethren from Florida probably know nothing of this, <laughs> unless you're an avid fisherman. The main fish that they harvested in the Sea of Galilee in the ancient time was something called a blue tilapi. You know what that is? Claudia says it's kind of tasteless, but uh, in any event. And that fish is also native to one of the few places in America native to Florida. And then that just popped into the reading. I thought, gee, that's interesting. So these devout Jews seeking to come back into harmony with God through John's cleansing and, and reinvigorating their uh, Jewish faith have left their vocations and come down and they, the distance here, they're, they're about a hundred miles away from their home. So they've got quite a trek to get back home and to get back into the uh, workaday world. <laughs> and it's of interest, brethren, and somewhere I do need my notes on this. Um, it's of interest that this took place in the fall of 29, and we will find as we walk through the gospel records that it wasn't until after the Passover in 30 that the gospel record tells us <clears throat> of Jesus, and we'll come to this a little later, Jesus coming to the shores of Galilee and telling Peter, uh, Andrew, James, and John, leave your nets follow me. That's from the fall of 29 to uh, after the Passover in 30. That's uh, quite a stretch of time before they had given up their jobs to follow Jesus full time. And it wasn't until after the Passover in 31 as we walk through the gospel record, Jesus chose the 12 to be his special sent forth ones from amongst his disciples. I find this fascinating. I wasn't aware of the time span here. 
and just a couple of frames of reference on this, brethren. Uh, reprint, and I, I, I had read this before from Brother Russell, but Brother Russell caught on to this. Um, in reprint 3720, Brother Russell is, had said regarding Luke, the fifth chapter, the, the calling of uh, uh, Peter and Andrew and James and John took place, he said, a year or more after Jesus' baptism. So this was kind of news to me for my own negligence, I'm sure, of failing to look at this earlier. Um, okay, and I'll pause there. So, brethren, this is the, uh, the introduction of the disciples, um, John's disciples, uh, following Jesus. And I think it's worth noting <clears throat> that five of Jesus' apostles were disciples of John. Five of the apostles were from Bethsaida. One apostle, Matthew, from Capernaum. Four apostles were fishermen that we know of. And one apostle only was not Galilean. Who was that? Judas. Judas actually spoke a different language than all the others. I'm sure they understood one another, but so he was the outsider, and therein lies a big lesson in and of itself. He had a different vocation than the other, than the others, and he, he was somewhat of an outsider right from the get-go. So Aaron continued in his lesson by mentioning the account of the first um, miracle of Jesus that is given in uh, John, the second chapter. <clears throat> and it says there, and the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and Jesus and his disciples were invited and attended. And as Aaron said, that's about approximately a three-day journey to get there. I have found this incident fascinating to try and understand the dialogue between Jesus and his mother. His mother, concerned that the host is running out of wine, comes to Jesus, and then Jesus' reaction to her seems out of place somehow. However, seriously? <laughs> I'm just getting started. <laughs> oh my, oh my. Um, I think this is my first or second slide. I've, I've got lots more. Uh, you know, I, I apologize. I'm going to go 100 miles an hour. So I, I don't think there was any conflict here whatsoever with regard to Jesus and his mother. Where you read in the King James, Jesus said to her, woman, what do I have to do with you? That's terrible. What is it you want, woman? That is his idea here. And she said, uh, oh, and he says, my hour has not come. It's not time for me to start performing miracles to prove myself as the Messiah. I think that's the long and the short of what he is saying here. And so um, I, I, I don't think there's conflict whatsoever. Okay, let me call through this, brethren, because I'm going to... Uh, Just, oh, oh, I love this, but we don't have time for this. The, 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 uh, this is, I, I, I was going to give you a, two of my favorite stories here, <laughs> but we just don't have time. Uh, so, so Jesus has, um, gone to his first Passover in Jerusalem and there, it's time to leave Jerusalem because uh, uh, Pharisees uh, were cottoning on to him and they didn't like him much. So Jesus, it, it's time to go to go back to Galilee. And on the way to Galilee, he stops uh, in, uh, he goes through Samaria and he stops. Why, why can't my brain wrap through this? He stops in um, Help me out here, brethren. 
Oh, not Bethlehem. He's north. It, it call. Um, hang on one second here. Why is my brain not connecting here? It calls it. I. I what's that? Sekar is. That's the terrible name. That's that. That doesn't do any good whatsoever. Um, yes, yeah, so that's where he stops and meets the woman at the well. But why? What was the name of that city? Samaria. Well, yeah. Well, Samaria was actually a different. He needs to go through Samaria. There was a city of Samaria, and um, hang on one second here. I, I I am terrible. You know, I blame it on age. I'm. Uh, What what am I looking for here? Check them. For the life of me, I just couldn't get wrap my brain around it. That, that's the place. Check them. Check them. And that that's the West Bank. That's where Nabal is today. That's where uh, Jacob's well is. Okay, excuse me. I I apologize. I just couldn't get it out from the back of my cranium so i apologize what a story he told never told anyone as clearly as he told her i am the messiah the one you're speaking to i'm the messiah you imagine how that must have rocked her world because she was half jew and half gentile as uh samaritans were i, I love that story okay let's let's get to some other ones here oh i was i wanted to talk about this one where Jesus goes back to Nazareth and goes into the synagogue and reads uh, as the scroll is given to him, reads from that wonderful prophecy in Isaiah, I'm here to preach and to, for deliverance. And, and, and they got so upset at him. He said, today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. However, I'm not going to perform miracles to you to prove who I am. Just like in the Old Testament time, God favored Gentiles in several instances before he favored the Jews. And they got so wroth, they took them to the crest of the hill. So if you've been there, brethren, you will remember that two miles south of, of Nazareth, there's this, what's it called? Mount Precipice or something like that. That cannot be the place uh, could, because this happened on a Sabbath day. Can't be the place. They, they, that was more than a Sabbath day's journey. There's this little hill, 50 foot tall, behind a Maronite uh, church, which ha it can be the only place where it possibly is. So next time you go to uh, Nazareth or to Israel, make sure you take that in, because where they take you on tours there is, although I'm sure Paul's got it correct, uh, Paul and Joyce on their upcoming trip. So they call... I love this story, brethren. In, in uh, Luke, the fifth chapter, is the call of those four disciples from their fishermen. And does this ring a bell at all? Jesus comes by and sees Peter and Andrew <clears throat> and, tell, and they're exhausted. They have been fishing all night. Nothing happened. Jesus said, cast your net over onto this side of the boat and they said, okay, they knew Jesus. Yes, they were his disciples, but they weren't following him full time at this point. And they throw the net over. It's so filled, they can hardly get to shore. Peter falls down on his knees and said, Lord, please leave me alone. I'm a sinful man. And Jesus assures Peter and gathers them. Now, this is in... Uh, this is in 30, and they are now following him as full-time uh, disciples. Um, and this, is, this is one of my ultimate favorite stories that we'll just gloss through. Do you remember the story? It's su supposed to be in Peter's home where Jesus heals the paralytic, the man who's been paralyzed. His four friends bring him up, and as the Jews want to have in olden times they had uh 
a staircase that went outside the building and the flat roof and somehow or other the tile, I think, over the porch area, they removed the tiles and dropped him down. That, brethren, I, we won't have time to go into it, is worth getting uh, Farrar's Life of Christ. And I've got it on my tablet. It's a free download as a PDF. His incisive language, his perception of, of that instance. I, when I think of what I would have liked to have been, this is, uh, you know, if I could transport myself back in time and been to certain of these uh, locations and situations with Jesus, this would be in my top two or three at least. I just would have loved to have been there because the paralyzed man is put down. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, creates an uproar, and they had no access to Jesus. Previously, his four friends, so they went up in the roof and dropped him down after removing the tiles. Now, the scriptures say it's almost like the parting of the Red Sea. It says that he got up and took his litter, and whereas before he had no access, now the the waters parted and he walked through the cloud. Can you imagine? It says the people blew their minds. That's the new translation, right? <laughs> they were, uh, it literally says they were amazed. And the word, the Greek word means something like they went out of their minds. I like that. <laughs> uh, okay, let's, I, I really wanted to, oh, my time's up. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Just really quickly, uh, I might change my lesson for tomorrow, uh, possibly on this. I don't know. But uh, in um, in uh, the sixth chapter of um, of Luke, uh, there is the choosing of the uh, twelve apostles, and and if you read the account, the Sermon on the Mount almost appears to have happened shortly thereafter. But never forget, brethren, that the two accounts of the sermon in Matthew, the fifth to seventh chapter and Luke, the sixth chapter, it's, it's debatable whether it's the same incident or, uh, or two separate incidents. And there's good rationale on either side of the thinking of this. But I'm somewhat inclined to think that it was one and the same incident that was specifically focused on the disciples. And in reprint, and I'll leave you with this, brethren, just as we wrap this up. In reprint 5003, Brother Russell says, the Sermon on the Mount in its very essence was a blueprint for his apostles and for his disciples at large in the audience of many, a blueprint for them on how to make your calling and election sure. So yes, he spoke of the law in its letter and its spirit, etc. But the essence of it was, he said, it's a blueprint on how to make your calling and election sure. And brethren, um, I will conclude with this slide. Jesus' ministry, he came to minister, not to be ministered unto. And one of my favorite verses of Jesus' last discourse in John 13 to 17, in that upper room, Jesus said that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father has given me commandment to do what? To lay down his life and provide a ransom. He said, even so I do. Jesus was thinking the world of mankind in the kingdom will see what I have done in my ministry. My mi the mission of my ministry is to lay down my life and the world will know that I did it because I love God. What an example for you and I to lay down our lives because what? We love God. And Perhaps one of the most important components of his ministry was the giving of himself for his disciples. Even unto the end, he loved them. And he prayed for them uh, before they left that upper room. And he said, I don't just pray for you here. 
I pray for all those, you and I, that may that you and I may be one, even as he and the Father are one. Uh, thank you, brethren. May the Lord add his blessing. I apologize for running.